smiling in as we go. So first off, I'd just like to um, and thank everyone for coming. This is the, the beginning of our 2017-2018 um, series, um, academic year series of the lecture series for the VCBH. And we have a great lineup poster for the year, and I think you can see that on the VCBH website. Um, and then to get us started in our series, we have, I'm very excited to, um, to have uh, Dr. Michelle Lawfall here with us. Um, Michelle and I, I guess we were just saying about 15 years we've known each other. We crossed paths at Johns Hopkins when we were both postdocs there only a decade and a half ago, not very long ago. Um, Dr. Lawfall is an associate professor now of behavioral science and psychiatry at um, the University of Kentucky, where she went after Hopkins. Uh, she's a board certified uh, psychiatrist. She's board certified in psychiatry and addiction medicine. And she um, it really juggles, has a lot of balls in the air. So um, Dr. Lawfall maintains a, a very um, robust outpatient addiction um, service, as well as being heavily involved in teaching and research. Um, she has been the recipient of a number of um, medical student teaching and mentorship awards, um, grants, NH and, and um, industry-sponsored grants, and she's also a current board member for the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine. And so today, uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Lofwell share with us some of her clinical and research work um, with rural opioid-dependent uh, populations which is a topic very near and dear to us here. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Let's see, can you hear? Is that better? All right. So maybe I should, I just want to start um, by just finding out a little bit about you all. So how many of you are um, graduate students, either pre-docs or post-docs? Just put your hands up. OK. How many physicians? How about other faculty? Great. How many people are familiar with buprenorphine treatment? How many people think it's an evidence-based practice? That it is science? OK. How many think it's um, not a World Health class, um, or maybe it's not that it's optional or that it's, it's, a, it's something that's just added on to counseling? OK. So, this is a very different audience than what I'm used to. So I can say that I'm within friendly waters here, and that's not usually my, uh, my experience. So thank you. <laughs> I can breathe a little bit more now myself. All right. So I'm going to share some clinical research, but I thought that I really feel like history is repeating itself. And since I am, um, have been at Kentucky for a while, need to share the history of the public health services response to the opioid epidemic in the 1930s, which was in part that they were going to open up two hospitals and they were going to cure people. And one of those hospitals was in Lexington, Kentucky. The other one was in Texas. And they called the one in Lexington, Kentucky, the Lexington Narcotics Farm. And the big joke was where do you grow the narcotics? So they didn't really kind of get like the whole how you name things, marketing is important to really help pu people's public health back then. I think we still have that problem now with terms like medication-assisted treatment, right? Because doesn't that kind of insinuate that the treatment's something other than the medication? Do we call diabetes treatment insulin-assisted um, treatment? It's just a little bit of a misnomer, I think. And we have data that show that people who just get really, really great counseling, but you don't give them medicine, that guess what, they relapse and they overdose because they don't have any medication there to block the effects of that illicit opioids that depress their respirations. So they had them in the Lexington Narcotics Farm, and the idea that they, is what they, they were going to come for the Lexington cure and that they were really going to cure addiction. But the really interesting and novel thing was that they put research and the patients really um, together and integrated it, which was a wonderful idea. And this was actually the beginning of um, what would later become NIDA's intramural research program, that is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And they had some um, advertisements for it. And this just really, when I saw this, this just really rung true to me with everything that I feel like we're seeing in the newspapers now, right? All these victims of drug addiction, all, you know, the 
seeing the patients as victims from the pharmaceutical companies. This was all, you know, Purdue Pharma's fault, and then it's physicians' fault. It's pain is the fifth vital sign. But there's all these people, and we, and we hear about all of them dying and passing away, and it's all very true. And that there's going to be some grand public enlightenment. And then I saw that sun with the rays, and you know what I thought? It's the hub and spoke. <laughs> Come to Vermont. Right? I mean, really, really, that was like, oh my gosh. So, but, so the cure is not in Kentucky, let me tell you. You're doing a much better job, and this is the enlightenment, I think, think here. Um, because we have, this just reminded me of all the wait lists that we have in Kentucky, um, and people who want to come and that want treatment, and that we're not doing a good job getting into treatment. So, what we also see, this also, I was, my mind only let me see the colors of this map once I stepped into Vermont, which is in 1999, look how blue the country was, and that the hot spots of red, which were the opiate overdoses, and these, um, the blue is, you know, zero to two age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 of overdose death rates. So most of the country is not having that much overdose death rates, but by 2014, most of the country is no longer blue. It's a lot more red. Um, and as the overdose death rates have just really spread, and it's really hard to find an area of the country that's not affected by overdose death. Close to um, where I'm at, so I'm here in Kentucky, probably like right there, we call it the bluegrass region, but right in Indiana about a year and a half ago, there was an HIV break outbreak in a little town called Austin, Indiana. And they actually, their HIV break outbreak was due to injection of hydromorphone. And it was prescription medication. And they had higher rates of HIV than sub-Saharan Africa. And the CDC was very concerned. SAMHSA came in they, into this little town. And they were so concerned because it was on a major freeway that was going to hit the rest of the South um, that it was just going to spread. And this led the CDC to then consider doing a study about where was the next Austin, Indiana going to be. You know, um, and so they looked at rates of injection drug use and rates of hepatitis C, and they then predicted where in, the, where in our country are we at greatest risk for a spread of HIV if it's um, introduced. And they identified 200 and two, 220 counties. These are all primarily rural counties. And you can see that the Appalachian region continues to be a significant problem. Here you are in Vermont, and you have a little bit of issues here, but your, your close neighbor, Maine, has, has a lot of problems as well. So this is, maybe your you're hepatitis C, HIV, you're like, mm -hmm, you, can, you can draw this connection to the IV drug use. That's not a, not a big thing. But the next thing was something that I don't think that y'all are maybe thinking about or that maybe your colleagues in hospitals are seeing, but they haven't necessarily drawn the connection or realized that there's something that they can do about it. And that's the other type of infections, besides hepatitis C and HIV, that are starting to really affect hospitals across the country. So this is a paper from Health Affairs that was looking at um, databases of hospital admissions that um, get CMS funding, so that it's all, you know, your coders, that, and we're looking at the codes of um, opioid abuse and dependence in all the hospitalizations in 2002 and then in 2012. And there's you know, about two and a half fold increase. The length of stay for these hospitalizations is six days to about five days, number of procedures, just one, but the total charges, this is 4.6 billion to 14.9 billion. Okay, I can just tell you medical charts are not very good. Physicians are not very good at documenting addiction, opioid abuse or dependence or other things. So this is an underestimate. They then looked and pulled those charts and said, well, what about hospitalizations not just with opioid use and dependence, but also with another infection? Met a fewer, but a significant increase over time. And the length of stay here, now this is unheard of. Lengths of stays in, the, um, in our hospital systems, they're always trying to be close to you know, three, four days, you're in, you're out. Um, to turn over those beds and to get them to a, you know, a step-down facility if they still can't go home. The number of procedures, a lot more, and then the costs here. And you could say, well, this isn't even a billion, so that's really not anything. But again, this is a complete underestimate. And um, where I'm at in Kentucky, and I was just at a meeting with the American Society of Addiction Medicine, Every, all the physicians in that room said, we, this is 
this is a complete underestimate. They're completely overwhelmed. Their infectious disease services, their um, cardiothoracic surgeons um, are all overwhelmed with the deep-seated infections due to injection drug use, and usually a majority of that is due to untreated opioid use disorder. When we pull this out and look at what kind of infections these are, we're seeing endocarditis, so an infection of the heart valve is that has had the biggest increase and is the most common. Osteomyelitis, which is an infection in the bone. Septic arthritis, so when the infection gets into the joints. And then epidural abscesses, which is um, when the infection gets into one of the linings of the brain. These are incredibly um, infections and lengthy infections that you have to treat with IV antibiotics. And, and guess what? Our physicians are really excited about sending people home with, you know, lines that are injection drug users to get their six weeks of antibiotics at home. No, they kind of, you know, don't want to do that. They're really worried that they're going to inject at home right through that line. But the idea then is that, well, we'll keep them in the hospital that whole time. But the whole premise besides that is that they're not going to use if they're in the hospital. Really? That's not true. Right? Um, so, I mean, I can just tell you that we're suffering a lot with overdoses in the hospital, in the bathrooms, right outside. I mean, in Kentucky, we have the right to vote. So you want to, not the right to vote, the right to smoke. The right to smoke and the right to vote are the same in Kentucky, okay? So when you want to smoke, you get to go outside and smoke any time, really, that you want. And so it's, a, it's kind of a sad scene to see all these people um, with really serious infections and quite young as well with their IV poles and, you know, they're out there, they're smoking. Um, but they can also easily walk across the street to the speedway and you can see a little interaction between a car and they can get heroin and then bring it back into the hospital and inject in the bathroom and then you can have, you know, um, someone coding and needing Narcan within the hospital. So this premise that it's safer to have them in the hospital also really is a fallacy in my mind. So this is all like, as a physician researcher, I'm like really excited. There's all these questions that we can answer and new um, providers that we can be um, trying to engage and get to see that this is a disease that is worthy of treatment and help us have a voice to really get the science, what we know works, into our patients. Um, so I, I thought that I would try to focus on some of our research, some that's um, well-cooked and um, has been published, other that's, that I'm trying to like move in the direction, and that is really at a very early stage um, with chart reviews and trying to illustrate how um, you can maybe try to encourage getting some of uh, maybe your young healthcare providers that are providing primarily clinical care but want to stay in academics um, so maybe you can get them hooked um, and that you can really have that crosstalk that I think is really needed since all the patients, you know, the patient with endocarditis, you can't separate their brain and addiction from their heart. And, um, you know, this whole idea that you're with our insurance system, the healthcare system, it's all becoming more specialized, but it's still the whole person. We still need to treat the whole person. Um, and then I was just going to highlight some of... Um, some of my favorite people that I've met and um, have really, uh, I think, hopefully will be, will be contributors to, to us moving forward in positive ways. So you, most of you raised your hand knowing what buprenorphine treatment was and um, appreciating that there was a really strong evidence base for it. So I'll just review this quickly, and you can ask questions at the end or, you know, shout something out to we're a small enough group, um, and I'm used to a rowdy crowd. So... Uh, don't, don't hesitate, we'll have fun. Um, so literally it took an act of Congress called the Drug Abuse Treatment Act of 2000 to allow physicians in outpatient practices outside of licensed opioid treatment programs to prescribe buprenorphine to people who had opioid use disorder. So access has expanded. It had originally just been physicians, but now it can be nurse practitioners or PAs, and there is a bill in Congress that's going to try to extend this to nurse anesthetists and midwives. So um, the cap initially had been at 100, but now it's 275. So there's really an understanding that we need more treatment and, and, um, and not less, and that it's not rocket science, that you, can, you don't have to be a physician to do this. Interestingly, also perhaps not surprisingly, um, 
the, this Suboxone, the first um, drug to enter this space as a buprenorphine product, has exceeded $1 billion in sales. So this has brought a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies to develop different formulations. And we can see from you know, studies in Baltimore City by Robert Schwartz, so Baltimore really met treatment upon demand and was able to show a decrease in heroin overdose deaths with treatment expansion. But, and the big but, is that it's widely misused and diverted, and this has really created a barrier to treatment expansion. And so there, there have been two different paths to this. Vermont has taken, I think, one path, which is seeing that we need to expand treatment more. It's a life-saving medication and hasn't necessarily seen diversion as a reason to clamp down on treatment um, and making sure that it's quality treatment. And Kentucky and a lot of other states have seen it as, you know, these are still bad people. They're doing illegal things. We need to put them in jail. And the doctors who are prescribing them, we need to regulate them more. And, um, and it doesn't matter that we've, uh, we can say, hooray, we've decreased the number of uninsured from 14% to 5%, but it doesn't matter that we still don't have any, enough physicians um, or providers that will accept Medicaid, that there's, there's no relationship between all these things or the idea that someone wants to get medication and they can't, that they would buy it off the street, is still is illegal and they aren't fully appreciating that. So with that, this is just another reality that I've become more vocal because in my state, I think we've been going down in the wrong direction for a while. Um, and the reality in my state is that you can go outside of a courtroom and see a posting like this uh, saying Suboxone users if you want probation or diversion and you're on Suboxone, you must be weaned off by the time of your sentencing date. So, I mean, major and minor signs of ignorance, right? I mean, <laughs> and if you haven't seen this, this actually made it into Jason Cherkis's um, article called Dying to be Free in the Huffington Post and really highlighted how, you know, frankly, it's discrimination. I mean, it's a violation of the Americans for Disabilities Act, how this just is going around across the entire country. And, um, and so this is kind of the reality that, that I'm dealing with. So it's not uncommon for, you know, regularly having, I have to write to a judge or have to write to um, someone in family court that, yes, they're on their medicine, and that's not a reason that you don't get to see their, that they don't get to see their children, or yes, they violated their probation, and I have no problem with them coming to do their weekend in jail, but I do have a problem with you not letting them stay on their medication that I've prescribed them. So, I mean, I've actually ended up, had uh, a judge decide not to put them in jail because he realized that I was not gonna back down and so we kind of let them off of the thing rather than try to try to fight. And so it was, it's, it's very, very interesting. And um, we are seeing a, a, some positive movement with more desire for education among the judges. And, uh, and I, I think things are starting to turn in the right direction, but this all takes time. So there are two medications um, that I wanted to talk about. One is, and these are both long-acting buprenorphine products, because, and I want to talk about them because I think that they get around some of the, um, the issues that people have with uh, non-adherence and diversion and misuse, just by the fact that they're long-acting products and you don't need to prescribe a daily oral medicine on top of it. So one is the six-month sustained release buprenorphine product, and this has already been approved. Um, I'm just gonna start with talking about this one. It's called probuthene. You may have already heard about it. It's a solid matrix subdermal implant. So it gets implanted underneath um, your skin in about 10 to 15 minute procedure. And there are these little itty bitty like match sticks. So they're about one inch long and they are uh, basically the diameter, a little bit larger than angel hair pasta. And they go in like uncooked angel hair pasta. And when they come out, they're like al dente, okay? so. They, each rod has 80 milligrams of buprenorphine in it, and you implant four of them in like a fan-like manner. No stitches are required. You can actually feel them under the skin, so when they come into the, um, the office, you can make sure that they're still there, that the person hasn't taken them out and tried to dissolve it to get buprenorphine out of it. And they release the equivalent of about eight milligrams or less of Suboxone equivalents a day for up to six months. And then after the six months, they have to be taken back out and you can put in another set. This is intended for stable patients 
who are doing well on buprenorphine, naloxone already, and are at a dose of eight milligrams or less. So that's its FDA indication. And the study that was a, a pivotal study um, Dr. Sigmund was involved in was a 21-site study, and it was outpatient, randomized, double-blind, double-dummy, six months. Um, patients were randomized to one of two groups. So one group had implants that were placed subdermally that were placebo, but then they got active buprenorphine naloxone tablets every day, and then the other group had active implants placed, and they got placebo tablets every day. And they came monthly for visits, and then there were three additional or four additional random visits for urine testing as well. There were a total of 10 urine tests over the six-month study. And patients were 18 to 65 years old. They um, also, their, their providers that they were coming from had to say that they were clinically stable, which was more than just, you know, they hadn't used any illicit opioids in the last 90 days, but that they also were adherent to other parts of their treatment program. And, they, and clinically stable could be defined in many different ways, but it could be that they had a job, they had meaningful relationships, um, that they were, it was, I think it was, there were criteria that we're really trying to get at is the addiction in remission, is the substance use disorder in remission. And the primary outcome was having at least four of six months with no evidence of illicit opioid use. So we'll just go straight to the results. 177 people were randomized, 166 completed. Great retention, right? Like almost 100%. When do you ever see that in addiction treatment trials? And this, um, the primary analysis showed that 96.4% maintained four or six months without illicit opioid use. The sublingual group, 87.6. Now since this is an active comparator, it's a non-inferiority trial design. So this is the p-value for non-inferiority. The secondary analysis was actual abstinence over the entire six-month period, so having all 10 of those urine tests that were negative. And that showed 85% uh, in the implant group and about 72%. This was a priori um, defined to be tested for superiority, and this did met the criteria for superiority of the, of the implant. And these are just the numbers needed to treat, which are pretty decent. So this ended up getting published just this past year, and the FDA approved it in May of 2016. So I, I've been trying to, to use this. I have this with several patients now, and they just love it. And I think one of the benefits that I see is some of them do live farther away. And if it's, you know, bad weather, they call, say, you know, can I reschedule? Yes, I'm not worried about them running out. I have, you know, our state regulations require that we only can prescribe until the next visit. So if someone has any sort of emergency, it always ends up being chaos. You know, can we call in some? Are they lying to us? What else is going on? It's, you know, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's not efficient. Um, so that, that has been nice. And then the patients that have had it now have also said that they just they just notice a difference not having, that they're just not having to think about taking it every day, setting their alarm to take it or worrying about where it is. I mean, these are stable patients. These are, are kind of like our perfect patients that are employed. Many of them have jobs like with sales, so they don't have to worry about traveling with it. You know, they put it in their, um, their baggage that's checked. Do they bring it through security? You know, all those kind of questions. So it, it would be nice to see this used more and, um, you know, maybe some research to see about, you know, how much stability do you really need? Could we be doing this with a little bit less perfect of patients? And, you know, what if someone's really, really stable and perfect on 16 milligrams? Could you give them two sets of rods or give them one set with eight? Like, um, because the, this is just, I think, the, the benefit, one of the benefits um, is just there's just much, there's fewer tablets or films, whatever it is that you're prescribing that are available for, um, people to have it stolen from them or sold or shared because they have someone else in their family that's addicted but can't get into treatment or can't afford treatment or what have you. So the reason why you see any um, tablets here with the implant is that there was rescue treatment. So if someone came in and really didn't feel, felt, and the physician felt that they were really didn't have enough um, dose coverage with the implant, they could prescribe some additional sublingual on top of it. But it was pretty infrequent that that happened. 
So I loved this study. We, there was a lot of criticism because it was like, oh, this, is, this isn't real. You have almost 100% retention. No study has that. And it's like, right, well, no one ever studies stable patients, right? Everybody else is new to treatment. They're all in crisis. And so I loved this because it actually shows not all of our addicted patients are nightmares. You know, like they get better and they can stay better. And, um, you know, I never thought that my patients were nightmares, but that's not what my colleagues think in the ER and in the hospital when they're overdosing on their, you know, in, in the bathroom or they're not in the room when they need to go for radiology or they're not in the room because they're, you know, when it's time for them to get their next infusion of antibiotics. So I just thought that this study has broader implications um, to really destigmatize the patient population and, and, the, and see the disease really as something that's amenable to treatment. Um, but also shows that even our perfect patients aren't perfect, right? People can still have a slip. There wasn't complete 100% maintenance of abstinence. So, um, so that's that. And now I want to talk. Oh, so our new partner here. So I'm a psychiatrist. I was not going to be putting in, using, you know, cutting blood stitches. Was not going back to that. So I needed to find someone who was going to do this for us. And unfortunately. I, I was, and it was able to find a physician in radiation medicine who I would have never really thought of um, that specialty before, but it was the perfect specialty because they're used to implanting radioactive material into really diseased tissue for cancer. So this was a piece of cake for him, and he, so he loved it. He, was, he became actually a master implanter. He had no adverse events relating to implantation or extraction. And he ended up going across the country teaching a bunch of other physicians on how to do it. So it was a win-win for both of us. So now I'm going to talk about, um, I think this is really exciting, the weekly and monthly depot buprenorphine product. I'm going to talk about one that's being developed by Brayburn and Camarus. But there's another product also that's very exciting that's being developed by Indivior. And I think what's particularly exciting is that one is being reviewed by the FDA on October 31st, Halloween. And the next one is being reviewed November 1st, the next day. So this is really, really soon, and they're fast-tracked. So if both we could have new products on the market if they're approved you know, in early 2018. So I think this has really a, a huge ability to um, change the way we're practicing and get more people into treatment. So, there are two studies I want to share with you. One is a phase two inpatient laboratory study with the Depot um, weekly product. And the goal here was to show that it can provide opioid blockade, that if someone has the weekly dose, that it can block the effects of an illicit opioid um, because that's what our patients are going to do. They're going to lapse and they're going to relapse. We want to make sure it's safe and that they're blocked just like they would be with the regular buprenorphine transmucosal product. So this is what it looks like. It comes as uh, prepackaged. It's a very small volume. None of the doses are greater than 0.64 mLs. The needle is 23 gauge, so it's um, really tiny also. And it is, uses this fluid crystal nanotechnology. So once it becomes in contact with water, it develops into, like it develops a little outer capsule. And then it slowly degrades over time to release the buprenorphine over the intended treatment period. Um, it has incredibly high bioavailability, so a weekly injection um, that you would have to give to approximate about 16 milligrams a day would be a single 24 milligram um, CAM injection instead of 16 times 7. You would just be giving 24 up front. And the dosing can be titrated, so there's different doses that are available. So the way this inpatient study worked is people were screened outpatient first. They had to be 18 to 55, have moderate to severe opioid use disorder, be physically dependent as well, and have a history with intravenous or intranasal use of opioids, but otherwise healthy, and they could not be seeking treatment. And that was because we were going to be exposing them to opioid, um, and you wouldn't want to do that to someone who is treatment-seeking and trying to stop. So first, they, we had to make sure that they and this, this was a, a study that the FDA helped design because it was going to be part of the new drug application for this product. And so the FDA really um, wanted to make sure that, um, that there was opioid blockade. So there were set criteria ahead of time. 
and there was an initial phase before people were randomized that they had to show that they weren't placebo responders. Um, so this was called the qualification phase. Um, patients were not patients, but these non-treatment seeking um, adults with opioid dependence as well as physical dependence are admitted on our inpatient residential research unit. Because they're opioid dependent, we don't want them to go into withdrawal, so we maintain them on morphine, 30 milligrams, four times a day, orally, for at least three days. And then they undergo a series of hydromorphone challenge sessions, or dilaudid. And they're given a single dose on each day in a randomized order. They may get 0, 6, or 18 milligrams. Each patient is exposed to each dose, so it's a within-subjects de design at this point to make sure that they are having, um, not having a placebo response. As long as they demonstrate that they're not having placebo responses to the active doses, then they get randomized. So what they do is they get randomized here to get either a weekly injection of 24 milligrams, which I, is approximately equal to 16 milligrams a day, or 32 milligrams of the weekly injection, which is approximately equal to about 24 milligrams a day. And so now at this point, it's parallel. So now they've been, this is after randomization, 22 people. So this was conducted at three sites. It was led by Dr. Sharon Walsh at UK at the Center on Drug and Alcohol Research. Um, 22 people received the 24 milligram weekly injection. 25 received the 32 milligram weekly injection. And it's supposed to last for seven days. So they wanted to show that it works in the beginning during those first three days, and that it also is still working and still blocking at the end before you get your next injection. So they repeated this exposure to each of these three doses twice, once on days one through three, and again on days four through six. They then got another injection of the same dose that they'd received previously, and they did the same thing, because they're looking um, to to make sure that there's no safety problems. PK, they're also doing some PK in this study too. And then they're discharged and we follow them up. So this was the primary outcome measure was um, on drug liking. So the volunteers are asked at this moment, my drug liking um, is, and there was a bipolar scale. So 50 is neutral and 100 is extremely. And you can see here, this is before randomization, so people are just maintained on morphine at this point in time. And they're given placebo, and then this is your six milligram hydromorphone injection, your 18 milligram hydromorphone injection. You see a nice dose-related response and liking for it. They are then randomized, so they get their first injection here. This is the first three days after the injection, and then the last three days after the injection, but we're just looking at the, the, the doses in their, their order, even though these are randomized. And you can see that there's a very diminished response, so it's, they're approximately neutral, and this did meet the FDA's criteria for opioid um, blockade. They then get another injection here, and that is, is repeated again, and you still see the sustained opioid blockade. So, Summary from, from this is that this is good. Opioid blockade is important. This is one of the mechanisms by which overdose death is prevented. Um, also, when they were randomized and they got that first dose, there was no um, initial test dose of sublingual. So they went straight onto the induction dose. So this is just kind of important to know for clinical practice. Of course, though, this is an inpatient double-blind you know, double study, so things can happen a little different in an outpatient setting, but nice to know there was no precipitated withdrawal with going on to 24 or 32 directly. But then you could say, well, this is all great, um, but what about its effect on illicit opioid use? What is like going to happen in the real world with, with patients? These were not treatment seekers. So we have a study for that, um, and Stacy was involved in that study as well. And this uh, was also randomized, double blind, double dummy, um, using an active control as well. And two groups, uh, people were treatment seeking in this study, 18 to 65, had to have moderate to severe opioid use disorder. And they get randomized to the kind of normal standard of care, which is sublingual buprenorphine naloxone every day for 
24 weeks, or they get randomized, and here they're getting um, placebo injections, or they get randomized to the CAM injections for the first two weeks, it's a weekly injection, and then it's a monthly injection in phase two. And of course, this is matched, so they're getting monthly injections of placebo and weekly injections here. But they're getting placebo, uh, buprenorphine, naloxone every day. It allowed for flexible dosing, up to 24 milligrams of buprenorphine, naloxone daily is a sublingual, which its equivalent is 32 of the weekly. And then in phase two, they did allow um, to go up to 32 milligrams of buprenorphine naloxone, which it's a monthly equivalent was 160. Visits are weekly in the first 12 weeks, and then they're, month, they're monthly in the last 12 weeks. There's an additional three random urine drug tests in the last 12 weeks of the study in between each monthly visit. And if someone wasn't do, doing well, the provider could ask them to come back more frequently so they could have more frequent visits for counseling or um, for any other reason if they thought that the patient needed it. Um, vast scales about needing to use opioids um, and craving for opioids were also asked about. The COWS was done, the clinical opioid withdrawal scale, as well as the subjective opioid withdrawal scale at each visit. And so because this, this, um, this company is trying to get its approval in Europe and in the U.S., um, Europe and the U.S., they're the equivalent of the FDA in Europe is called the European Monitoring Agency. They um, wanted to have a primary outcome of the proportion of urine toxicology results that were negative for illicit opioids. This is in contrast to the U.S. Drug Administration, which wanted a responder rate, which the FDA decided was going to um, require nine illicit opioid negative urine, urines that are supported by self-report. So that means that the self-report, they have to say, yes, I didn't use. The self-report could only basically undo the illicit report. So if the illicit drug tests said nothing's showing up, but if the self-report, the person said, yep, I used heroin, that became a positive test result. So three wanted, the FDA wanted to see three negatives in phase one, specifically at that last visit in phase one at week 12, and two more in between weeks nine to 12, and then six in phase two at the last visit, and then at five of the six urine tests between weeks 13 to 24. So it's a little bit of an unusual outcome measure. A little over 400 people were randomized, approximately 38 years old, um, a good number of males as well as females. Uh, th three quarters were white, one third were employed full or part time, over half were IV opioid users, 70% heroin users, and a large proportion were also testing positive for other illicit drugs. So. Um, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Retention was good, so this is a study also that its aim was efficacy, was not effectiveness, this was efficacy. So people are paid to attend their visits, they're not paid for what their urine tests show or anything like that, but we want them coming because we don't want missing data. Um, so retention was about 79% at the end of getting weekly injections, then 70, about 70% 70 at the end of phase two, which is when treatment ends. They then just enter into follow-up where they can enter into standard care, but now, um, and then we had 60% there. At the end, the total days of medication exposure, not different between the two groups. The primary endpoints, the FDA responder rate, um, and this is a non-inferiority trial also, so I had learned a lot about non-inferiority trials because the first time I saw this, I thought, oh no, it's crossing, you know, it looks like it's crossing zero, and I'm sorry that I didn't switch these to white, um, but this line here is crossing zero, and I thought, oh, this is, this is so heartbreaking, but that's not the case. That would be if it was a superiority trial. So actually, it's a non-inferiority trial, and the pre-specified margin for safety was 10%, and so it's way to the right of this. Um, and it's actually, what it means for non-inferiority trials is that when it goes to the right of zero, it favors um, CAM, and when it goes to the left, it favors sublingual, but still, it's the p-value is only for non-inferiority, so. But overall, uh, not, a, not a robust uh, response rate either. The European Monitoring Agency, which looked at all the urine tests, so remember, the, the FDA is really only looking at urine tests starting at week nine, right? They're ignoring the first eight weeks 
of the study. But the European monitoring agency is looking at all of them over time. You have a better um, response right here, about 30% with buprenorphine and just a little bit over 30% with subcutaneous. Again, not, in, not inferior. We allowed 11% margin. There was a secondary outcome that was pre-specified to be tested for superiority if the primary was um, shown to be statistically significant. And this was the cumulative distribution function of the percentage of opioid negative urine samples supported by self-report that were negative. And so here, the FDA wanted to allow, still wanted to allow a grace period, this idea that you know, people are being titrated to the right dose initially and that we need to be forgiving of early illicit drug use in the beginning. So the urine tests that were looked at were only over weeks 5 to 24. And then for each individual, you figure out how many of those were um, were negative, and then you put it into SAS and you do a probability function, and what it and this is what you end up seeing. So you have the percent of your participants here, and then you have the probability of the illicit opioid negative samples here on the y-axis. So this is the the um, the fifty percent line, or actually the median, because fifty percent of the participants are above and fifty percent are below. And what you see here is that about twenty. The median is about 20, a little about over 20% illicit opioid negative in the CAM group, and that the median for the sublingual group is actually zero. When we just look at the raw data, which is what Stacy and I like to do, and <laughs> uh, then this is the raw data over time, where you can see that the CAM group is the black group, that there is a higher rate of illicit opioid negative urine samples. This is really hovering about 30%. Um, and here's your sublingual group, and uh, these time points here marked by the black asterisks are just indicating that there is a significant difference between the two groups at those point in time. Looking at craving, so this was important because I think a lot of us are always worried that if with a depot product, you know, how long is it going to take um, for the craving and withdrawal to subside? And what we saw is that craving was high on the day of randomization before they got their injection. Um, score of about 78, and that this is the day after where it's greatly diminished, and then this is three days after. So it really goes down quickly, and it's the same as the sublingual group. And the sublingual group is at a total of 16 milligrams on day two, on the second day. They get 12 milligrams on the first day, and they get 16 milligrams sublingual on the second day. And then this is opioid withdrawal. So this is also very nice that they're really right on top of each other here, showing that there's a rapid suppression of the opioid withdrawal symptoms as well. In terms of the safety, there were few serious adverse events. Um, CAM had 3.2%, sublingual had 6%. Um, drug overdoses, there were five drug overdoses in the sublingual group. Um, three of these were heroin. One was actually with some in the context of someone going to jail, not be allowed, not being allowed to take their medication, and then um, relapsing to heroin when they were discharged. Um, local tolerability was pretty um, reasonable, with considering that they're they're getting an injection, so you're going to expect to have some injection site reactions. There are 19 percent um, prevalence of injection site reactions in the CAM group, 22 percent in the sublingual group. And the majority of these were um, mild, 74%, 26 moderate, and zero um, severe. So overall, we're excited about this um, new, you know, the new potential uh, new treatment for this. Um, we saw the non-inferiority it met its, you know, it met its primary outcome, it met its secondary outcome about superiority, and the safety profile looked similar um, aside from the injection site reactions that are inherent to an injectable formulation. So we think that this could have a lot of implications for different treatment settings, right? So people coming to the emergency department, you know, but then being discharged, whether it's for overdose or they're coming because of cellulitis or something else, but it's very clear that they have an opioid use disorder. You know, um, I think the ER doctors are a little nervous about starting a prescription there, but if, what if they could have an injection um, and didn't have to be prescribing? You know, maybe there's some some potential there. How about for the hospitals? Also, these periods of transitions where maybe they're started on buprenorphine in the hospital, but now you can't get an appointment for a month with the buprenorphine provider. You know, could this be used as, as a bridge and um, help, help people transition into treatment better? 
So with that, I, we're trying to do some of this transitioning and working on it within our own hospital. And this is um, my new wonderful colleague um, that has made me take out my Bates uh, Medical School textbook on my stethoscope once again. Um, because she is the hospitalist treating all of the patients with endocarditis and osteomyelitis. And she just got so frustrated that um, you know, there was no one to, to treat the opiate dependence. And so really, this is kind of the scenario of what happens is that they, they're injecting and they get um, an infection in their heart. And then to treat the infection, you need to get the antibiotics right into the heart. And so in order to do that, they put in this um, indwelling catheter and it comes out here. This is actually what it looks like. They call it a PIC, a P-I-C-C. -C. And there's two ports here so that you can draw blood and you can also infuse your antibiotics through there. And you usually have to have antibiotics for six to eight weeks. Um, and she was just frustrated because she couldn't find any you know, skilled nursing facilities or home health willing to take these patients because everybody was worried about the liability. So they were staying in the hospital. And so we encouraged her to write it up because we were seeing a number of, of patients basically returning to the hospital after very costly admissions, um, just relapsing. But you know they're on Medicaid, and we've just spent probably four hundred thousand um, dollars just giving them a new valve, and no one can figure out how to get them maintained on buprenorphine, which is what sixteen twenty dollars a day. And so I, you know. We, so we got really excited. She got really excited, um, too, that she actually got this little perspective piece published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I felt like I got a lot of my anger out, like talking about policy, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this. And so this was fun. But actually, it's a huge opportunity for any, you know, if you're trying to make collaborations with physicians or other healthcare providers, because there are no guidelines for how to treat addiction in any of these surgical specialties or medical subspecialties. And so you can have very high impact case reports and all of these things. And that can just be enough of a really positive reinforcement for you know, that doctor healthcare provider to say, yeah, maybe I do want to try this out. Or yes, I will work with you. Um, and it can be really fun for you, too. So this is just a picture of the valve and like what will happen, what they call these vegetations. Um, and so. Dr. Fanuki, Laura, recently just completed um, as the PI uh, a study with the patients uh, where she actually found a treatment facility that was willing um, to take our patients for extended care. They said that they were at an addiction treatment facility and would maintain them on buprenorphine. So we're really excited about this. And so she prospectively followed these patients. Um, 42 um, subjects were just in this study. Um, just the age range, so you can see 20 to 56 with endocarditis getting valve repairs. They're really young people, an average age of 34. Um, a good proportion female, you know, largely Medicaid. The length of stay in our hospital, average of 38, but the range up to 92 days. So this is driving the hospital administrators crazy, crazy. And you know, largely hep C positive, 80% have infective endocarditis. So she did allow people with osteomyelitis and other kind of deep-seated infections that had the pick also into the study. Only 20% were really were willing to go to the residential rehab. Most people did not want to go. They wanted to go home. They had enough of being in the hospital, even if you're saying you don't have to spend your whole duration here. And then, even of those that go, went to the residential treatment, 23% left AMA. So we had a, we know we had a, we had a problem. So we now have some internal pilot funding. Um, and we've uh, brought in Dr. Walsh as well, who is really good with study design. So I love this, I love this um, bringing the PhDs in who have very clear thought and you have been trained to narrow questions down and isolate them. And that's not like what physicians are necessarily trained to do. We see everything all together and have to compromise and make decisions quickly and have a question that is probably has 50 questions embedded within it. And so I think bringing together the scientific rigor with the, the clinicians has just been a really beautiful thing. And I kind of just think of myself then as a translator. Like I know, I know enough research, I know enough medicine, and I can kind of bridge the gap um, between the two and, and have a lot of fun. So this study that we're doing now is where this is for patients who have endocarditis and opioid use disorder, and are, that are wanting treatment with buprenorphine. We will. 
every, initiate everyone on buprenorphine in the hospital, and then they get randomized to either maintain, to stay in the hospital for the full duration of their antibiotics through their PIC, or when they're medically stable, they get discharged to me three times a week, and they're giving themselves the antibiotics through, through their PIC that we help arrange with other services. So the, cl the cl clinical question was, was it safe to discharge them early? Because we were having s this idea that people don't use in the hospital was false, and they weren't really getting great treatment there. We need to get them back into their community, and they're young, and they have families, and they want to get on with things. So um, we, this is what our plan was. So recruitment has been, we can't really keep up with recruitment, which speaks to how many um, endocarditis cases we have. And the results to date, I'll just say, it's very easy transition within the hospital to buprenorphine. People feel better immediately. We're not having any problems with precipitated withdrawal or with control of pain. So there was a lot of concern. How can we control their pain? I think everybody's hypersensitized about pain. Um, it's just very overwhelming need for services. Um, rapid opioid absence. So I'll say, like, Ongoing opioid use has not been a problem when we're testing people three times a week and they're attending all their counseling, they're coming, they're really excited to be in the trial. Um, and it's been really, really rewarding to the providers. And it's, we're starting to see like there's a little bit of a culture change on the services where we're recruiting from because we're able to like go back and give them feedback that the heart valve repair that they did, they're still alive, they're doing well because they're just seeing people over and over again at their worst of their worst and then they see them come in nearly dead and they think they've just wasted their time and that they're wasting everybody's money and we start hearing things about, well, why should we, you know, this is tax taxpayer money, why even do the valve repair? Maybe they need to be abstinent before they, we, you know, for so long before we do the valve repair. Um, so that is um, one thing that has just, I think, is just important and a nice consequence of the research too. And then I'll just say that we're trying to do something similarly with um, NAS in our OB providers. Um, we've had a huge increase in NAS in Kentucky, probably um, like the rest of the country as well. And we had a young obstetrician who was from Kentucky but then um, did her fellowship in MFM out east, came back and said, what are we doing? We're not doing anything. We need to be providing addiction treatment and this would help with NAS. And so you would think that you know maybe you need an organizational system that looks something like this to start a new service, but um, there were two very very um, committed providers, um, both Agatha Critchfield, she's the high risk OB, and Kristen Ashford, who had been a labor and delivery nurse, she went and got her PhD, and the, between the two of them, they just did it. I mean, they just did it. And um, I got to kind of just watch and, and help make some protocols and answer some questions along the way. And then they found this wonderful neonatologist who volunteered her time. And they are having great results. And now um, Kristen obviously had her PhD, so she was doing research already. But Agatha now is writing a K award. And never, she had never thought that she would be thinking about that. Um, just have to hit it. OK. And so this is just, this is not research, this is just their clinical outcomes, but they're, I think that this was our way in, like if I had gone in and said, do you want to do this research study, they would have said no. I mean, I actually went to Agatha to be the implanter for the probufine, and it was like, no, why would I want to do that? You know, it was like, she, her thing was patients, you know, the patients, and that was like, yeah, she got how it was collaboration, it was research, but it wasn't like, it wasn't close enough to her. So this spoke more to her, and I think that's how a lot of physicians um, or other healthcare providers can be, but they're having great outcomes. They report 97% of the babies cared for by their mothers had no NAS medication treatment required. These are the moms that are on buprenorphine. The length of stay is approximately six days um, with care by mother versus 23 days in the NICU. So the neonatologist has also been really good about advocating for rooming in with the babies, getting you know the skin on skin and. Um, all that and seeing a lot more breastfeeding um, when they're rooming in together rather than um, otherwise and uh, that 90% of the babies are being discharged into maternal or family supported care. And so this has been good too because the state is listening and is trying to support, support them so that they can ramp up with numbers and they're now just um, submitting these to journals to try and get some publications and, and get more into research. And so I don't know if this is going to work but Okay, well, so they interviewed um, one of the patients, and this was uh, 
that was in this program. It's called Pathways, which also includes beyond birth. So after birth, they're, they're holding on to these women to try to, because they see it still need the need for different variety of services. And this um, young woman, Kelsey, she said, you know, where would you be without this program? This is uh, Kristen asking her this. And she said, I'd be either dead or in jail because I'm a repeat offender and was carrying a lot of guilt and shame. What would you like to share? And she says, oh, well, I get emotional because my children have a mother. My nine-year-old never had a mother, but my son will never be without his mother. I can fully protect my children now. I'm very thankful for Pathways because I'm here, and I'm not just wandering around existing. I'm living a life, and it's very beautiful. So, you know, so in, in summary, I think we've tried to hit upon a lot, bunch of different things, and so that's kind of how my mind is, too. I kind of feel I'm going in a lot of different directions, but overall... I think the message is that, that I'm seeing really to improve the public health is that the research has got to get integrated with the clinical care. Um, I, and, and that there's, there's these amazing opportunities and um, you all are at the forefront of doing all of this as well. And that there, hopefully there'll be even more opportunities with some new formulations available in the new year. And um, my acknowledgement, so Sharon Walsh is my mentor. So she's um, been, the person that's really taught me how to do research and understand a um, whole lot of different things. And then our statistician, Paul, and then these people that I've just talked to you about that I'm working with closely. And with that, I think there's a, a little time for questions. Maybe we have just one or two minutes here, and then we, I don't know if there's a group comes in at one, but okay. we can always drag you outside. Yeah. yeah. Any, any questions for Michelle right now? You can be brave. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.